My name is Carwell Bjork James. I'm an anthropologist at Vanderbilt University, and this presentation introduces Ultimate Consequences, a digital archive on lethal conflict in Bolivia, 1982 to the present. She was running from the gunshots when she fell, the child in her arms. Adelaida Chambia Mamani had good reason to fear the Bolivian military and police that day. The president, Gonzalo Sanchez de Lozada, had ordered that the military break through the general strike and its blockade in the city of El Alto, no matter the cost. And they were carrying out this directive with dangerous abandon all across this city of the poor and working class and indigenous. The shots were not warnings and the ammunition was live and she ran, clutching her son, Kevin Colquewanca Chambilla. She ran and she fell, badly. And that fall brought about the death of her child. That Sunday, October 12, 2003, at least 21 Bolivian government bullets had ended the lives of protesters against the privatization of the country's gas resources. It was the deadliest day in three decades of democracy, and the killings continued unabated through the Monday that followed. Word came to Jaime Estaca Apaza, president of the Neighborhood Council of Villa Ingenio. Before the day had passed, without the certainty that someone was ultimately listening, this local official took a sheet of official stationery, stamped it with his seal of office, and signed his name to a typewritten statement to certify as much as I can and to the degree that the law allows me, and, quote, in honor to the truth, unquote, the details of Kevin Kolkewanka's death. No matter what happened to their besieged neighborhood, there would be a record of this event. In May 2019, I sit at a wooden desk in the downstairs office of the Permanent Assembly for Human Rights in Bolivia. Bound in three in a three-wing notebook are two sheets of paper on the death of Kevin Kolkewanka. Kevin's name appears in line 350 of my Bolivia database, the main instrument of a research project that I have been working on for four years, documenting the ultimate consequences of political conflict in the hemisphere's most active country for protest. The database offers the most comprehensive and informative record of social movement-related violence in Bolivia's democratic period. What strikes me as I hold these two pages most is the jarring incongruity between this ultimate violation and tragedy for Adelaida and, Rami and Ramiro, the firing of military rifles in their neighborhood, and the sudden unthinkable death of their recently born child, just as they thought they might ex escape, and the formal, even bureaucratic necessity of archiving the facts of the event for some future reader. Some future reader meaning 16 years hence, me. What combination of reparation, atonement, justice, accountability, understanding, and meaning did these two grieving parents and their surely overwhelmed community leaders see lying beyond that sheet of typewritten paper? And which, if any, could my work provide? Bolivia's history, marked by indigenous uprisings, labor militancy, and frequent military rule, has been described in terms of blood, fire, dynamite, and massacres. In line with this history, mass grassroots politics in Bolivia has have found highly contentious forms of mobilization and action that are neither purely nonviolent nor akin to insurgency, occupying a middle ground that I have termed unarmed militancy. My prior research has focused on identifying and characterizing key elements of the Bolivian repertoire of contention, including marches, road blockades, civic strikes, cabildos abiertos, or mass public meetings that make demands and guide the course of mobilization, and hunger strike pickets, as well as street confrontations and, and property destruction. I've spent a a decade working to understand Bolivian movement's power, and I did not give up that focus when my immediate attention turned to violent deaths, what could be understood as their weakness and vulnerability. The meaning I seek in Kevin Kolkewanka's untimely death is in part an answer to timely questions. Bolivia consistently ranks uh, among the most politically engaged countries on earth in terms of its participation in public protest. But protest and movement participation in Bolivia are also sometimes dangerous. How can we understand the exceptional risks and actions of Bolivian protesters? And how can we understand the power and limits of state violence? Specifically, under what conditions can mass movements survive and succeed in the face of deadly state repression? What social and political factors restrain governments from using deadly force or persuade them to stop using it once they have started along that path? Can data collection help hold leaders accountable for directing violence? And in part, I want to ask more intimate and cultural questions about the role of risk, violence, and sacri sacrifice and loss in transformative social change. Bolivian social movement traditions include proclamations of fearlessness and vows to carry struggles 
um, quote unquote, until the final consequences. That is to persist in collective measures and to refuse to be deterred by deadly state violence. Fears and risks are real and important and an important part of Bolivian protest, which can involve intense privation, self-sacrifice, and either enduring or inflicting violence. After someone dies in the course of struggle, movement leaders often remember how victories, quote, have cost us blood, unquote. To better assess the role of death in Bolivian political conflict, I have led the creation of Ultimate Consequences, a comprehensive database of individual deaths over recent decades. This work began during my 2010 to 11 fieldwork and has been systematized in an Um, onto a Google Docs-based spreadsheet since 2015. It is compiled based on multiple sources, including media reports, governmental, intergovernmental, and private human rights reports, and the research literature on political conflict. The work of documenting deaths and coding entries for the database has been carried out by a research team, including myself, Vanderbilt doctoral students Chelsea Dyer, Emma Banks, and Nathan Frisch, assisted by undergraduates participating in Vanderbilt's Research on Conflict and Collective Action, or RACA, laboratory. In its current phase, it documents deaths during the period since the restoration of democratic rule in October 1982 through to the present. We estimate that there have been some 625 to 660 deaths in Bolivian political conflict during the study period. This estimate builds on prior tallies of human rights violations by the Permanent Assembly of Human Rights of Bolivia, covering 1988 to 2003, and a study of the COCA conflict from 1982 to 2005. As of November 22nd, the project had identified 621 to 639 of these deaths, including those of 600 named individuals. Each death is coded in several categories, including the individual's relation to a specific social movement, protest campaign, cause of death, responsible parties, and geography. In the remainder of this talk, I offer several overviews of the pattern of lives lost in Bolivian political conflict and a taste of what the database can show us about three questions. How important is presidential direction in affecting the level of state repressive violence? What does empirical data show us about the relative lethality of different tactics? And what were the political outcomes after multiple people were killed in the course of mobilization? Here's some of what we know so far. The vast majority of the 601 confirmed conflict deaths were violent. 498 direct deaths, 41 deaths inflicted on uninvolved bystanders, and 16 more where the victim was possibly a bystander. Six people died as a result of, indirectly, of violent acts. Accidents in the course of conflict claimed 21 lives. 15 died due to the privations of the forms of protest they, or in several cases, their adult family members, undertook. And four Bolivians sacrificed their own lives in acts of protest. Among the 555 violent deaths, we have coded the perpetrators and victims in all but five cases, where the perpetrators are unknown. As the alluvial diagram here shows, state security forces perpetrated 317 of those deaths, far more than any other group. Security forces were responsible for the vast majority of violent deaths among cocoleros, students, teachers, uncategorized protesters, and civilian bystanders, as well as a major share of deaths among minors and campesinos. Fratricidal conflict among highland indigenous communities, largely in the War of the Ayos, in interethnic strife in Potosí and Oruro, and minors claimed 43 and 23 lives, respectively. The security forces lost 67 members to violence, half of that perpetrated by cocoleros, and a quarter of this total occurring during a 2003 mutiny. Guerrillas and paramilitaries, coded as armed actor, inflicted seven deaths, all but one upon civilians, and suffered eight deaths at the hands of security forces. In some arenas of protest, state violence predominates, notably in the conflicts pressed by labor movements, challenges to taxation and gas privatization, and peasant movements. Conflicts over coca also center on this state, but with much more significant deadly violence levied against the state. At the other extreme, conflicts over rural land, including the Guerra de los Ayus, struggles between large and small landowners, and lateral conflicts between claimants to the same land, largely result in deaths among non-state actors. A similar pattern appears in many mining conflicts and, on a smaller scale, urban land disputes. Partisan political conflicts lie somewhere in between. At its most basic level, the database shows a simple pattern, a steady presence of deadly conflict at a low level, Um, interrupted by three dramatically more lethal years, 2000, 2003, and 2019. The year 2003 was an exceptionally deadly and violent year for protest in Bolivia during the democratic period. 
142 deaths were recorded in 2003, largely due to the February uh, tax riots and the September-October gas war. The Bolivian government killed 105 people in 2003, the highest number since democracy returned in 1982. Political violence in Bolivia is intermittent and episodic, with no deaths recorded, uh, recorded in 327 of the 477 months from November 1983 to July um, 1982 to July 2022. 12 months saw 10 or more deaths. Um, 17 events account for half of all confirmed deaths, and the 49 events with th three or more deaths comprise 72% of all the deaths in the data set. After reaching a crescendo in the October 2003 gas war, the results of a steady rise from president to president since 1989, state perpetrated violence fell dramatically under Carlos Mesa, reached zero under um, Eduardo Rodriguez's seven months in power, and remained at historically low level under Evo Morales. Mesa effectively withdrew as uh, Sanchez de Lozada's vice president in October 2003, rather than bear responsibility for bloodshed, and crafted a January 2005 decree limiting military repression, which remained in effect until November 11, 2019. In quantitative terms, the limits Mesa began were extremely successful and long-lived. During these three presidencies, state perpetrated deaths dropped to 2.4 per year. Overall deaths in this period were 9.6 per year, a return to pre-1993 levels of political violence. Overall, as you can see in this table, presidents had a dramatic impact on the level of violence and the level of state-perpetrated violence that occurred under their rule. Through the use of R scripts, the database can aggregate the individual deaths to facilitate analysis of events. Event is a term with many definitions in the study of uh, social movements and contentious politics, um, but the meaning that we use in the database is perhaps captured, best captured by Charles Tilley's term episodes, bounded sequences of continuous interaction. Every death in the database is associated with a precisely one event, and each event is coded as part of a protest domain, one of 18 general areas of political cont contention, and a more specific protest campaign. Any one of these three levels of grouping can be summarized quantitatively and combined with data specific to the events, campaigns, or domains. We perform one such analysis to study the outcomes of acts of lethal repression in events with three or more deaths. This table showing events in which there, were, there was deadly repression, but also death to sec state security forces, illustrates how quantitative aggregation, the desk columns, can be joined to newly coded data about events, the outcome columns, to produce novel information about patterns across events. In the larger information, larger analysis, we found that movements that face deadly repression were equally likely to succeed whether or not they inflicted deaths upon security forces, a finding that challenges important assumptions in the civil, re in the civil resistance literature. Detecting and characterizing emergent patterns is an integral part of the coding process in qualitative research. Um, as the research team coded documentary sources, uh, coded each death and wrote narrative accounts, we also found recurrent patterns of state repression and political violence across the study period. Once such a pattern is found, we are then able to consider the pattern, create a formal definition for use in our codebook, codebook and review the corpus of events and deaths for similar occurrences. One such pattern is political assassinations, which we came to define as targeted killings of persons in organizational leadership or political office. The data set contains 21 confirmed or possible political assassinations. In several cases, such as the 2001 shooting of coca grower union leader Casimiro Wanka and the killing of Laimi Paraka community leader Lucio Churokaya, assassinations occurred as part of broader violent assaults. And in at least eight cases, deaths occurred in criminal or suspicious circumstances and survivors pointed to a political motive, but there was no definitive investigation that identified the perpetrator or held them accountable. The frequency of political assassinations in Bolivia is relatively low for Latin America, but the threat of violence seems particularly significant in inter- and intra-partisan political disputes. We also expect that such violence may be underreported relative to other types of violence documented in the database, and therefore that we will add further such killings in the future.
Finally, the data set allows some insight into the lethal impact of certain weapons used in political conflict. The deployment of tear gas appears as a cause of death in 30 cases, more frequently than in all but two, all but two other causes, gunshots and beatings and assaults. 16 people died from inhaling tear gas and subsequent medical complications, eight were fatally wounded by the direct impact of a tear gas canister, and five fled an outdoor discharge of of tear gas only to be trampled to death. This quote-unquote less lethal munition is thus responsible for one in 18 violent deaths in democratic Bolivia, raising critical questions about how it is used. The data set offers a grounded view on questions such as what social movement practices and government, p- governmental political choices result in high or low records of violence throughout a president's administration? What is the relative importance of different forms of political violence from repression of protest to guerrilla movements to fratricidal disputes among movements? Which movements have succeeded despite deadly repression? The broad scope of our data means that the project intersects with a variety of areas of in- inquiry, including human rights, regional history, histories of labor and indigenous peoples, social scientific studies of the state, social movements, agrarian life, and studies of the role of violence, nonviolence, protest, and policing. We are hard at work on creating simple tools to allow social scientists, oral historians, and human rights advocates to generate and access summary data and individual entries in the database to answer their own questions. In 2023, we will publicly release an R package that allows researchers to search, query, and visualize the data set and multiple web accessible views of it. Please stay tuned. Thank you.